Good evening, everybody. Can you get your attention, please? We can get everybody settled in and uh, in a comfortable position. We'd like to get, get started here at 6 o'clock. So uh, my name is Jeremy Mohawk. I'm a wisdom organizer, and I've been asked to do the invocation for this evening. Um, before I do that, though, I'd like uh, to acknowledge the the land that, that we're standing on is indigenous land, indigenous to the uh, great Menominee Nation, to the Ojibwe Nations, and uh, the Ho-Chunk Nations, Potawatomi. So just want to take a minute, in, uh, in, our, in my language we say, no lam wai wi we acknowledge them, because this is their land and who they are. I'm from the Stockbridge Muncie Indian Reservation in northeast Wisconsin. We have a border right with Menominee, so we've grown, our tribes have grown close over the years, and uh, would like to give a couple words to the Creator on our behalf in, uh, in uh, my original language. So you get to, you get to hear some of the, the first sounds ever spoken in this hemisphere. So with that, uh, I do have to do a traditional um, uh, say my name and stuff like that. Otherwise, when I got back, uh, there would be a handful of elders right there to greet me and <laughs> correct me. So, so I have to do that. All right. Papa Kwalashuk, away a suck walk while I show shuck. And Bartomo Wetna lack it at Litaha and Martin Nilona. And Bartomo Wetna el and Nuck Tuck and Lakamak Tuck Pleo walking. Bartomo el Huawana el Awamoanik, Winamasa Wikanung, walk Tatawanika Sikonung. At PT, Nakau Sitna Nakawa Mingsa, Wamalisok. Anishik el Awamoanik. Mawalati Yotali, Batamo Wetna, Elawamoan, Wingao Siti Kwai Kishquik. No Lamwa Wit Wawak, Wulimane Towak, Wapanawang, Shawanawang, Wasikung, Lowanawang, Ingekina Aki Wakapamakami Kakwang. Mech Gishim Batamawa, no nen. Those words that I uh, sent up to the Creator on our behalf, what I said was, uh, my name is the South Star Spirit. I'm from the Caribou Clan. I'm a Mohican Muncie man from the Stockbridge Muncie Indian Reservation. Um, we pray to the Creator today and thank Him for all of the, all of the blessings that, that He's brought to us. And I said the, the plants and the trees, the grasses, the animals and the birds, all them things that we need to, to um, live. And uh, I asked for, a, for another day of a great awakening. You know, everybody coming together in this room, we're sharing energy, so I ask that, you know, maybe some of us can have that light bulb go on, you know, and uh, I prayed for the ones that are, that are in the hospitals or clinics, and I also prayed for the ones that are behind bars. A lot of our brothers and sisters are locked up, and, and they need them prayers too. They need our help. So we always acknowledge the ones that couldn't make it here, you know, and then I asked, uh, Ask that everybody uh, enjoys themselves here tonight. You know, every time we get together, we sometimes can can turn negative, and we want everything to be in a positive way, in a good way. So I ask that those things be done in that way. And then I acknowledged all of the helpers from the four directions: the north, south, east, and west, and the, our Mother Earth, and and from the sky. So with that, uh, starting off on that positive note here. Um, We'll move right along on the agenda. Again, uh, Anishik, thank you in my language. Wamwan Anishik. Good evening. I just want to say thank you all for being here tonight. It is so ha I'm so happy to see all the people that came out for this very important event. Uh, many of us work hard. We work hard on our advocacy, our leadership, um, to make change in Wisconsin. Uh, my name is Melissa Luden. I am the president of Ex-Incarcerated People Organizing, known as Expo. Uh, with our organization, we work to end mass incarceration uh, through Wisconsin. Uh, we have a group of formerly incarcerated men and women 
um, that work collectively together throughout our state, uh, not only to end mass incarceration, but we want to end the structural discrimination that comes with that. And we also want to restore our men and women back into their communities to full participation. Um, that's so important. Um, thank you. Expo, thankfully, was born out of wisdom. That came back in 2015. I had the privilege to join um, not only wisdom through Esther, but also Expo uh, back in 2015. Um, with wisdom, uh, one of the, the, the many great things about the organization is it's non-interfaith. Um, came from Gamaliel, the National Gamaliel Foundation, so we have members of those people here as well. Uh, wisdom has um, 11 affiliates throughout the state of Wisconsin, and again, I'm happy to be a part of Esther, uh, Esther Fox Valley. Uh, when we take a look at wisdom, uh, wisdom has been formally known um, by the campaign of The Rock, Wisconsin. And The Rock, Wisconsin uh, stands for to restore our communities um, that was beyond the 11 by 15. Um, it called to change for a drastic change in the way we see people with conviction histories, and they are not offenders. They are people, members of families, and assets to our communities. So important. <laughs> Another th uh, quick thing I'd like to point out, uh, Wisdom also has a very long standing um, to commitment to public transportation. Uh, lack of mass transit affects on all of us, um, as well as Wisdom and Gamaliel has stood with and for immigrants for many years, educating, advocating, and acting together with our newest neighbors for policies that express our compassion and respect for all people. Very important. Wisdom has also organized on the Menominee and Indian Stockbridge Muncie reservations. An important issue that has been brought to us by the Menominee is the need to stop the Back 40 mine, which would dig up the ancestral burial grounds, <laughs> destroy a prestige forest, and endanger the Menominee River and Green Bay. So again, I would like to welcome you all. Thank you again for coming. And Wisconsin change is coming. It's coming. Good evening. My name is Tamarin Hayward, and I am Wisdom Vice President. Before I introduce our co-sponsors for the evening, I would like to see who else might be here. And maybe you could make a little noise when I mention your area. Um, do we have people from Kenosha here? All right. How about Racine? All right. I brought them here, so I knew they were here. <laughs> Milwaukee. Madison. All right. Eau Claire. They came a long way. Green Bay, right. Manitowoc, okay, go, Wausau, there they are, the Menominee and Stockbridge Muncie Reservations, right. Beloit, Waukesha County, Expo, and other parts of Wisconsin. <laughs> Anything I didn't mention? All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you and welcome to everybody. We're so happy to have you with us tonight. We are pleased and grateful to announce the co sponsors for tonight's forum. So please, if you are representing one of those co sponsors, Please stand when I call your name, and then everyone hold their applause until I've mentioned all 16 of our co-sponsors this evening. Wisdom Action Network. Go ahead, stand up, Kelly. <laughs> uh, School Sisters of Notre Dame. All right. Sienna Center. You can stay standing. Stay standing. Mothers Against Gun Violence. Forward Kenosha, Wisconsin Alliance for Youth Justice, 
School Sisters of St. Francis. We are blessed tonight. We have a lot of nuns in the audience. <laughs> ACLU of Wisconsin. Cincinnati Dominicans. Sierra Club. Gamaliel Network. All right. Grassroots North Shore. Wisconsin Council of Churches. NAACP of Dane County and the Wisconsin Turners Confronting Mass Incarceration Committee. Let's give them all a hand, thank you. <laughs> you may sit down if you hadn't already. All right, the format for tonight's event, for tonight's forum, is as follows. We have identified 12 issues that are important to Wisdom and its affiliates. And we're going to discuss those tonight. There are other issues certainly out there, but these are the 12 that we have chosen to discuss. After a three-minute explanation of each issue, a pertinent question will be asked by one of Wisdom's leaders who works on a task force that deals with that issue. The candidates will respond uh, by holding up a card that's either green, that's for yes, they agree, that's they're pledging something there, uh, red for no, or yellow if they really can't say, they're really uncertain. And we will record those electronically. We have someone in the front who's doing that. And they will also be announced. Kelly behind me is going to announce them so that you in the audience, if you can't really see from where you are what they're holding up, and you don't see who, you can see their faces from where you are, uh, she'll be telling you their name and what they have said. It, it'll also be recorded for us. After the 12 questions have been answered and recorded, there will be five more lightning round questions, which will be without long explanations. And these will be answered in the same manner. I'll be reading those. All the candidates have been previously uh, given briefing materials on these issues, so we're not surprising anyone. We're not trying to trick anyone. And you, the audience, also have in your packets that you received coming in that same information. After the questions and answers, each candidate will have five minutes to make a presentation to you, the audience. Further information, which is provided by the candidates, is available on the tables in the exit area when you're ready to leave. And you do, can stay around afterwards and talk to candidates if you wish. Now we are ready for our first issue presentation and question. My name is Wayne Scottam with Justice Overcoming Borders in Rock County, and I have personally experienced the brokenness of our healthcare, healthcare system. Healthcare, including medic, medical care, is recognized and delivered as a human right by almost all developed countries in the world. By contrast, in America, healthcare is recognized as a human right, but is delivered as a commodity pay to play. One out of every three people either delays or foregoes medical care because they cannot afford it, whether insured or not. As a result, when forced to seek uh, care, the cost of treating those patients is much higher. Thus, health care costs continue to skyrocket, which we all pay for whether we know it or not. Not only is the economic cost of health care driven higher, but also hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of Wisconsinites and their families needlessly suffer or die due to lack of access to affordable health care. In my case, I suffered severe pain from a deteriorating hip for close to 10 years. I could not afford the $3,500 deductible for hip replacement surgery. As a result of the lack of my mobility, I fell on ice at my church's office, broke a bone near my ankle on my left leg, and suffered a severe tear of the rotator cuff on my left arm. I had surgery near my ankle in January of 2009 to repair the fibula, surgery to repair the rotator cuff in March. In July, July I had hip replacement surgery, and whether you realize it or not, everyone in this room helped pay for three surgeries instead of one. In the case of my daughter, she was not covered by health insurance for many years. Thus her PCOS and fibromyalgia went undiagnosed for years. She became morbidly obese largely as a result of the undiagnosed and untreated PCOS. 
She treated, she worked as a CNA for 10 years and gained, finally gained health care coverage through her husband's employer around 2010. She went from being able to walk upwards of five miles per day in December of 2011 to needing the use of a cane, walker, or wheelchair by May of 2012 at the ripe old age of 26. She was diagnosed with a herniated disc at L5-S1 with bilateral impingement. Surgery was precluded due to her obesity and the insurance company would not cover doctor-assisted weight loss so she could qualify for surgery to relieve her chronic pain. But they covered and continue to cover all the maintenance costs for pain management. She has recovered some of her mobility but still lives with chronic pain. Economically, the point of these, these stories being that between my daughter and I, close to a million dollars has been spent on what is called unnecessary, unnecessary care, all because of the lack of access to affordable care. Everyone in this room, in this state, and in this nation paid and continues to pay for that unnecessary care, thus driving up the cost of health care for everyone. Therefore, if you are elected governor, Will you support the expansion of Medicaid Badger Care to provide all Wisconsinites with affordable access to their human right of health care? And the answers are if you can turn your cards just so I can see your names. I want to make sure we get it correctly. Uh, Flynn, yes. McCabe, yes. Mitchell, yes. Gronick, yes. Roy's, yes. Weinhout, yes. Wax, yes. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> Seek to understand, then to be understood, Stephen R. Covey. My name is Robert Agnew, Jr., and I have been directly impacted by Wisconsin Department of Corrections Crimeless Revocation Policy. Friday, January 17, 2014, I will never forget this day. It was the beginning of Martin Luther King, Jr. holiday weekend, and I was anxiously leaving work after receiving the news from my wife. Her favorite uncle suddenly died in Milwaukee. I had this on my mind the bus ride home. Exiting the bus, I was walking into my apartment complex, ready to see my wife and daughter. A Fitchburg police car crept up alongside of me and eventually asked for my name. I gave the officer my name and kept walking in the direction of my house. <clears throat> the officer asked me to stop and wait. Knowing I hadn't done anything wrong and to avoid being the next victim to a police shooting, I waited. <clears throat> Another squad car pulled up and as I began to ask the officer, what was this about? The officer said I was going to have to come with them because there was a body warrant for my arrest. I looked at him with shock and unbelief. I asked how. The officer showed me the screen that read PO hold next to my identity, but it didn't say why. The probation officer assigned to me issued a body warrant for my arrest, unbeknownst to me. That evening, I did not make it home to my family. I did spend the entire MLK holiday weekend in Dane County Jail. After the fact, I found out and experienced <clears throat> probation officers' authority to put body warrants out to arrest those on probation for missed appointments or going 30 days without seeing a probation officer. In my case, I had email communication with the probation officer assigned to me that very same week about scheduling our next meeting. The probation officer never informed me of this consequence and none of our communication. I did not make it home to my family. The officer in the second car sent the message to my wife and the first officer hauled me away, never reaching the doorstep of my front door. The four days and three nights spent in Dane County Jail compounded with the shock of being ripped away from my family and the shock of one minute walking home from work and the next minute in the back of a police car without committing a crime but going to sit in jail traumatized me. <coughs> this practice by Wisconsin Department of Correction Police Office <clears throat> needs to end. I should have not been forced to spend four days and three nights in Dane County Jail for missed appointments policy. Wisconsin temporarily holds thousands of other people each year at county jails 
and Milwaukee Secure Detention Facility, who eventually do not get revoked while the Department of, Wis Department of Corrections investigates allegations of rule violations. Seven states enacted policies more than five years ago that ended them to close prisons and greatly reduce both levels of reincarceration for revocation rates of violent crimes. If you were elected governor, will you direct the De Department of Corrections to end the use of incarceration for crimeless rule violations? Thank you. And your answers, please. The candidates' answers are Flynn, yes. McCabe, yes. Mitchell, yes. Gronick, yes. Roy's, yes. Vinehout, yes. Wax, yes. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Looks like we're off to a good start. Keep, keep the green. Keep up with the green. Uh, my name is uh, Bernabe Gonzalez. Uh, I am, uh, I've been in Wisconsin here since 1989. Uh, I am formally undocumented. Uh, I'm also happen to be, a, a, I have served honorably in the United States Army as well. Thank you. Uh, my question has to do with immigration. Um, I think that it's hard not to be outraged or sad or all kinds of emotions about what's happening specifically with, with the kids in the border, with the DACA kids, et cetera. But uh, you know, it's, it's, it's outrageous and uh, it's, 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 it's a shame. Uh, I personally have seen and, and have family members that are fearful of driving. I mean, people that work in the dairy industry that are thinking, is it going to be the last time I see my, my family today after going to work? So, uh, you know, immigrants face many, many hardships. Um, one of the greatest hardships uh, here in our state is the issue of transportation. The Real ID Act, uh, well, before 2006, Wisconsin issued driver licenses to undocumented immigrants. The Real ID Act of 2005 created new federal standards for state-issued driver's license and non-driver identification cards. The law allowed states to still issue driving privileges, certificates, or cards. Twelve states have changed their laws to allow undocumented immigrants to obtain driver license or certificates to drive. Some of those states include Colorado, Delaware, Illinois, Maryland, uh, among others. Those states hope to encourage unlicensed drivers to pass the driver's license test, the vision test, and obtain auto insurance, which makes it safer on the road for everybody. A study in California showed a significant reduction in hit and runs since they introduced the driver card program. Bills to issue driver's cards have been introduced in Wisconsin in 2014 and 2015, but went nowhere causing undocumented immigrants in our state to have greater difficulty getting to work, taking their children to school, going to the grocery shopping, uh, or even uh, picking up prescriptions. Uh, they're encouraged by necessity to face increased risk of becoming criminalized under new immigration guidelines. They're in constant fear of being targeted and profiled. As a leader of our state or as governor, would you help move legislation forward to provide a driver's card for undocumented immigrants in our communities? Just for the record, the answers are Flynn, yes, McCabe, yes, Mitchell, yes, Gronick, yes, Roy's, yes, Vinehout, yes, Wax, yes. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Yolanda Perkins. I am the data and director, the data and field director of Wisdom. Um, at eight years old, I was placed in foster care um, until I was 17 years old when I was given back custody to my mother who had just served 16 years and eight months. She was released without paper, so she wasn't on parole or probation. Um, I lived with her for about, the, for about a month until we got pulled over in a car. The police told us that she had a, viol a violation of parole um, hold, so they took her to MSDF 
where she spent eight months and she wasn't even on papers. I remember sitting at home in the sheriff van pulling up in front of our house to release her. She got out of the car, but she had this look in her eye. That wasn't really there before, and it never really went away. I never understood the look in my mother's face until years later when I ended up at MSDF. I remember being physically sick in the county where I went to the emergency room. The next day, I was transferred to MSDF, and I could barely walk, stand, or breathe. When I got there, I let them know that I was still sick and that the ER did not help me. I was then placed in a cell and told that because of training day, I would sit in there for 24 hours. And that we weren't allowed to come out. I couldn't eat, sleep, or even think right due to the symptoms of illnesses that I was having. And no matter who I told, they assumed <clears throat> that I was going through withdrawal and checked my blood pressure and sent me back to my cell. Six weeks went by of me steady complaining and nothing changed. I was so sick that I fell into a deep depression not only was my freedom taken, but much a big, large part of my life was also taken. I remember walking into MSDF and having to walk through a building to enter another building. I remember being cold, alone, and also fearing that I would die. The inhumane conditions at MSDF and the policies and practice that force people to be incarcerated there are out of step with Wisconsin's values of fairness, compassion, and equity. Tragically, at a time when Wisconsin needs bold leadership on human rights issues, nearly all public officials in the state have remained silent about Milwaukee's high-rise torture chamber. My question is, if you are elected governor, will you work with the Close MSDF Campaign Coalition to develop a plan to decarcerate Wisconsin, close MSDF secure detention facility, and reinvest resources saved to build safer, stronger, and healthier communities? Your answers, please. And the candidates answer are Flynn, yes, McCabe, yes, Mitchell, yes, Gronick, yes, Roy's, yes, Vinehout, yes, Wax, yes. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Kathy Zern and I am from Wausau, Wisconsin. I am the chairman of the Naomi Bus Task Force and have been working, fighting for transit for many years. Transit is very important to me because I am visually impaired and will never be able to drive a car. The transit system is my car key to independence. Public transit gives me the freedom and choice for access to jobs, school, medical appointments, shopping, recreational activities, and allows me to volunteer in my community. Public transit allows me and many others across the state and nation to live independently. Because I am transit dependent, I only have access to my community from 6.30 a.m. to 6.30 p.m., Monday through Friday. In the past, the bus took me to the neighboring communities of Rothschild, Schofield, and Weston, but that is no longer possible because 
the municipalities were no longer willing to share in the expense of public transit. Today, many jobs are available in these communities, but I am unable to get there. In addition to losing access to these communities, Saturday service in Wausau was also completely eliminated and fares were increased. For example, I needed to renew my identification card at the DMV so I could exercise my right to vote. But the DMV is not on the bus route. So I could not renew my card until I was able to organize a ride. Do you know how, have any idea how exhausting this is to organize a ride? This is just one example I have to deal with every day of my life. The car driving public takes for granted that you can just hop in your car and go. The car driving public also assumes that the bus rider can get anywhere at any time on the bus. But I'm here to tell you this is simply not true. Public transit is affordable, reliable, and accessible. It's a good investment for our community. For every $1 invested in public transit, it brings in $4 of economic development to a community. And remember, each one of you is only one accident, one illness, one major life event away from needing public transit. Think of us ride the bus. Think of us connect the bus. Think of us fund the bus. These are, these are three vital links to the future growth and development in our state so that everyone can have a place in their community. In order to achieve this, we need secured funding and enabling legislation for a regional transit authority in our state. Wisconsin is one of the few states in the Midwest that doesn't have this enabling legislation in place. I'm afraid if we don't invest in public transit, transportation, many transit dependent and choice riders will be left by the wayside. If elected governor, would you support the overturning of the statewide ban and on RTAs and return local control of transportation to our communities? Thank you. Thank you, and the candidates' answers are Flynn, yes, McCabe, yes, Mitchell, yes, Gronick, yes, Roy's, yes, Weinhout, yes, Wax, yes. I sense a shutout. <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Hello. My name is Barbara Robinson, and I am here tonight because I am a daughter a sister, a wife, and a mother, and one who is concerned about the parole and the compassionate release of those who are incarcerated. I'm a 23-year military veteran, and I'm a retired police officer with a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. I am, I am heartfully saddened by the way people are treated when they enter into the criminal justice system. The nearly 3,000 people who are eligible for parole and were convicted of crimes committed before the enactment in 1999 of truth and sentencing. Many people were given extremely long sentences by the Wisconsin judges who understood that they would likely be paroled after serving 25% of their sentence and have completed programs and deemed rehabilitated. More than 400 of those are low risk and they leave prison every day to go to work into communities and they are safe. 
All of these people are, have already served at least 17 years under the old law. Old law prisoners cost us taxpayers $95 million a year. But even more than that monetary cost is the frustration and the suffering that our loved ones are away, away from their families. A lot of the uh, incarcerated eligible for parole are elderly and seriously ill. These people should be moved and immediately identified and moved to the release process. Families are being deprived of a chance to have their loved ones near in the final days. In 1972, I was in, involved in a car accident and I was paralyzed from my waist down. Doctors told my mom she will not have kids. I had three. God gave me my three sons and the system took them. In 1995, two of my sons were convicted of party to a crime armed robbery with no prior police history, no involvement in crime, no record whatsoever. They were sentenced to over 130 years. My sons were 17 and 18 when they entered the prison system. They are 40 and 41. I have guards in there that worked one-on-one -on -one with my sons and they said if there's any such thing as an auto of a prize or a inmate, they are the ones and they should be released. My sons send those home to me and I send them back so that they can have them for their PRC review before going to the parole board. And the guards that wrote those were fired. Something needs to be done. Prisons are holding people saying insufficient time served. The reason they're denying them is saying that they have not um, served enough time. This is disturbing, and there is a lack of transparency and accountability for those decisions of the parole commission. There is no appeal process and no outside review. While very little data is kept, not to mention the implicable, the implicable records and praise exemplary conduct that they yet still deny parole. My son was told as many times, if you come up to me, I'm going to deny your parole. Parole means a release of a prisoner upon completion of a sentence and the promise of good behavior. People can and they do change. They are eligible for parole and should have a fair chance to earn their freedom if they have used their time in prison to change. Honest reform of parole system and review of cases should save millions of dollars in operating costs. My question to you, if you are elected governor, Will you immediately call for a complete independent review of every case of a person eligible for parole with the goal of releasing them who can be released safely? I'm not saying everybody needs to be released, but those who can be released safely. That's my question. And the candidates' answers are Flynn, yes, McCabe, yes, Mitchell, yes, Gronick, yes, Royce, yes, Vinehout, yes, Wax, yes. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Jane Audette. I'm the chair of the MICA Education Task Force, and we're going to talk a little bit about school funding right now. The Wisconsin Blue Ribbon Commission on School Funding has been traveling the state for the last six months. They've talked to educators, education leaders, community members, and parents, most importantly parents. <laughs> The same story gets told in every community that they visit. A 1990s revenue cap that's inequitable and inadequate for our school districts, especially in 2018, is harming our cash-starved communities. A decade of drastic school cuts has created no chance for those communities to recover from the harm that's done by that school funding formula. <clears throat> Many school districts are also experiencing declining enrollment. And the school funding formula we currently have provides them no relief. It's little recognized that declining enrollment actually increases per pupil costs to school districts drastically. 
And in addition to that, we've got our school voucher program that continues to grow, taking money from our public schools and investing them in an unaccountable private secondary system. The tour is over for our Blue Ribbon Commission, but we know what the problem is. What we're looking for now is leadership that's willing to produce the change in our state that our citizens are asking for with funding our schools. <coughs> On a personal note, I'm a school social worker in Milwaukee Public Schools, and I can tell you firsthand that I know the funding formula is neither fair nor equitable, and it's broken. Our state is not taking care of all of our students. This, specifically, to me and my profession, our staffing ratio in MPS is about a quarter of what my professional organization recommends for staffing of social workers in the school district. But let's hear from a school teacher because they're really the ones that are on the ground dealing with this. Good evening. My name is Peggy Drana, and I've been a teacher in Milwaukee Public Schools for 29 years. During that time, it has been my privilege to work with amazing families, many of whom are outstanding partners in their children's education, and some of whom are unable to participate fully in their children's education because they work three jobs, lack basic educational skills themselves, are addicted to drugs, or don't trust the institution of school. I have never, however, worked with families who don't love their children. During my tenure in MPS, I have comforted a K-5 child whose mother died of an accidental overdose, but I have never worked in a school that had a family donate the use of their vacation home to the PTA auction in an effort to help close the gap between what the state provides and what the school really needs to function. I've listened to complaints that MPS suspends too many children or too frequently and our test scores are too low, but I have never heard politicians or the press say large urban school districts serve many children who are affected by poverty, repeated exposure to violence and other forms of trauma. Let's support these schools by lowering class size, making sure that each school has adequate support from school psychologists, social workers, guidance counselors, and by ensuring that all of these children have art, gym, and music specialists in their building. As governor, will you make adequate education funding a priority and will you commit to working with the legislature to develop a more equitable funding formula that does not penalize diverse urban schools and smaller districts? Thank you. Candidates answers are Flynn, yes. McCabe, yes. Mitchell, yes. Gronick, yes. Roy's, yes. Vinehout, yes. Wax, yes. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Tulib Akbar. I'm the Vice President of Moses. I am a state board member of Expo. Solitary confinement is punishment that hurts people. Solitary confinement for more than 15 days is considered torture by the United States nation of violation of basic human rights. The primary task of prison is to foster safer community, not to be institutional sanction abuse. I have served 20 years in the Department of Correction, 10 stints in solitary confinement, <clears throat> averaging over three years. If you are elected governor, will you direct your Secretary of the Department of Correction to end the use of solitary confinement? for more than 15 consecutive days before the end of your first term. Wisconsin's next governor must immediately end the placement of mentally ill prisoners in solitary confinement, immediately end the use of long-term administrative confinement, order the Department of Correction to document and order the immediate reduction of 15% of the number of days inmates 
uh, spent in, so in segregation in Wisconsin prison system. Immediately began a process that will end all use of solitary confinement for more than 15 consecutive days in the Wisconsin prison system. Rick Ramish, former Secretary of the Department of Correction, has said that by placing a difficult offender in isolation, you have not solved the problem, only delayed or more likely aggravated it, not only for the prison, but ultimately for the public. In spite of moral and factual evidence against solitary confinement in hundreds of Wisconsin inmates are routinely isolated in closed cells for 23 hours a day. That's because they have one hour rep about three times a week. <clears throat> they are virtually free of human contact for periods of time ranging from days, weeks, months to decades. It is called segregation or administrative confinement, or more recently, restrictive housing, calling solitary confinement by a different name does not diminish the cruelty of future consequences. Please don't leave undone those things that ought to be done. If you are elected governor, will you direct your Secretary of the Department of Correction to end all use of solitary confinement? for more than 15 consecutive days before the end of your first term. <clears throat> Thank you. And the candidates' answers are Flynn, yes, McCabe, yes, Mitchell, yes, Gronick, yes, Royce, yes, Weinhout, yes, Wax, yes. Thank you all. Good evening, I am Reverend Carrie Parker, Executive Director of the Wisconsin Council of Churches. In my line of work, I talk to a lot of people who have kind of an expansive definition of neighbor. I was at a church meeting a couple of weekends ago and heard about a teacher who had a job at a quote unquote nice school in a quote unquote nice neighborhood with plenty of resources. The kids had everything you could dream of in the way of after-school activities and summer programs. Their family's big dilemma really was too much of a good thing. Their parents were trying to hire people to cart them from one paid activity to another. Then through her church, this teacher got wind of what was going on just down the road, not even a mile away, where the questions families asked were a whole lot different. In this nearby area, household incomes were lower. You might imagine, and you'd be right, that the skin tone of the folks in that neighborhood was a little bit different. And the questions weren't about how to get between three great possibility expanding programs. It's about how to get the kids to school, how to get to work or job training, the grocery store, the food pantry, and back. It was how to get to the doctor when they were sick without costing the family breadwinner their job, or making an already lightweight paycheck even lighter. It's how to fix the car when it broke down, and how to deal with the little hiccups that don't seem so little when your life is really complicated. Poverty wasn't that far away from where she worked, but this teacher hadn't seen it. She hadn't known because she didn't have to. And now, because she'd seen it, it broke her heart. Because these were also her neighbors. And they were working hard, too, for their kids, who were our kids. And so she left the job at the high school. And she went to work in this other neighborhood. Because once she'd met her other neighbors, she couldn't unsee their need. Ending child poverty starts with seeing what we have previously chosen to ignore and deciding to do something about it. Once you know that one in six kids in Wisconsin grows up in poverty, you can't not do something about it. Once you know that that disparity is greater for kids of color, you can't not do something about it. <laughs> a 
any number of kids growing up in poverty is too much. It represents a failure of imagination on our part when we have a chance to do something about it. The reality is that one hopeful, well-meaning person can't do something, but together we can. So if together, if you are elected governor, will you support legislation that would commit Wisconsin to a three-part goal of cutting child poverty in half, cutting racial disparities in poverty by half, and establishing a mechanism to reliably, regularly, and publicly measuring our progress. Thank you. And our candidates' answers are Flynn, yes, McCabe, yes, Mitchell, yes, Gronick, yes, Roy's, yes, Vinehout, yes, Dana Watts, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sarah Ferber. I am the organizer for the Chippewa Valley chapter of Ex-Incarcerated People Organizing. I am also a graduate of AIM Court, which is a treatment court that is gender specific for mothers, um, um, mothers to keep them out of prison. Alternative to incarcerating mothers is what it stands for. So I spent the better part of my adult life of 20 years struggling with substance use disorder and mental health issues. And that eventually led me into the criminal justice system. And when that happened, I was given the opportunity to participate in this treatment court, which I'm now a graduate of. Through that treatment court, I was able to address the root causes of my, of my issues of my substance use disorder, things like childhood trauma, um, sexual abuse, um, domestic violence, and those types of things. A lot of people in the state need this kind of program, but instead they're just shipped off to jail or prison. There's no reason why the zip code that I live in or the color of my skin should determine my worthiness of help, my worthiness of recovery, my worthiness of getting into a treatment court program. We need to make sure that the, the communities that need it the most, places like Milwaukee, are getting access to the treatment courts. Uh -huh. In Eau Claire, we have four treatment courts. I believe Green Bay does as well. But Milwaukee, which is exponentially larger than both of these areas, only has two. This needs to change. We need to see the funding increased for treatment courts, and we need to see that increase in funding go to the communities that are most in dire need of having these types of programs available to them. So my question to you is, if you are elected governor, will you include at least 15 million per year increase to, in TAD funding in your first budget? Yes. Thank you. And the candidates' answers are? Wax, yes. Weinhout, yes. Roy's, yes. Gronick, yes. Mitchell, yes. McCabe, yes. And Flynn, yes. Thank you all. What's up? I come from the first people that have lived here. We've been here for 11,000 years. Your science has proved that. We think we've been here longer. Nate <laughs> Nepowit, that's my name. First stander, that's why I stand here talking to you today. I was given this name by the spirits through our naming person. I come to speak for the water, because the water can't speak for itself. I want to say that again. I come here to speak for the water, because the water cannot speak for itself. How many of you? Had a drink of water today. <laughs> and how would that change your day if you did not have that drink of water? Did you give thanks for that water when you drank it? These are important questions because the powers that be, unfortunately, the powers that be are, are starting to treat us all 
like we live on a reservation. They put my people on a reservation and they took away our, our voices, but we're taking our voice back. And that voice is for nature, and that voice is for the water. And that voice is for what is right. The other thing that I, I need to say is that <clears throat> how many of your people do they dig up? 1956, they dug up my people. We buried them again last year. It hurt my heart. And that's for real. If they dug up your great grandmother, how would you feel? So, with that in mind, and I know you guys have to say yes. <laughs> It's only, it's only right, it's only right. But are you going to do something about it? Are you going to stand for the water? So I don't know if you're going to make it or not. Some of you, one of you is going to make it. But if you're elected the governor, will you support the reintroduction of Wisconsin's Prove It First mining moratorium? That was repealed just in the last time here. And that was protecting our water. Thank you very much. We can give you some more time to think about it. <laughs> and the candidates' answer are Wax, yes. Vinehout, yes. Roy's, yes. Gronick, yes. Mitchell, yes. McCabe, yes. And Flynn, yes. Thank you all. Hello, everyone, again. Uh, for those, um, I am Melissa Luden, president of Expo. Um, I'm here today to discuss the dignity for incarcerated women. Uh, we believe in the dignity of all people, including pregnant women who are incarcerated. We are joining a national movement led by women with lived experience of incarceration to demand women who are, who are incarcerated are treated with dignity too. I was incarcerated at the age of 18 up until I was 24 years old. I'm somebody that was impacted by trauma at a very young age, starting at the age of six, by being exposed to domestic violence, physical and verbal abuse. In turn, I grew up and lived that nobody was gonna hurt me and nobody was gonna hurt my friends. And in gathering that, my view of how to gain respect was to do it out of fear, which led me to be in the juvenile system at the age of 14 to 17. I was in the shelter care facility um, in Appleton during that time. My journey into incarceration began at the age of 17 um, when my father had passed away from acid reflex. The very day he passed away from acid reflex was a day that I was finally released off of juvenile supervision. I finally made it. When my father passed away and I found his body, it created a new trauma for me. And I didn't know how to deal with it. I blamed myself for his death for not saving him and I had shame. Following the year after his death, I was back in the system because I had a fight at a nightclub with a friend, which got me a battery charge and I was put back on probation. Close to a year from that and cycling downward in this spiral, I was involved into a car collision. I went to an intersection I was seven months pregnant with my son, and I collided with another vehicle that almost killed a man. Thankfully, he is still well and thriving and alive today. When my airbag protruded from my vehicle, it hit my stomach and caused my uh, son blunt force trauma. He was breached at the time. When I arrived at the hospital, my son was not the priority. The hospital I was at, their protocol was, your life is first, your son's life is second. So in doing this, I entered the, the jail system because I had a probation hold. In the jail system, there wasn't proper care. There wasn't anything to address the milk supply that would come in. There wasn't pads, none of that. When I had to leave to go to my appointment, 
I was in handcuffs and shackles. I had two appointments outside the county jail that required that. The difference between that is I was also released on a furlough to go bury my son's ashes, but I didn't have to be in shackles and handcuffs. When I went to the Tachita Correctional Facility, I had witnessed many women pregnant in the facility who also experienced shackles and handcuffs. No postpartum care and no proper prenatal. So my question for all of you is if you are elected governor, Will you ensure the dignity of women who are incarcerated by proposing and supporting legislation eliminating the use of shackles during labor and after later prenatal and postpartum care? Thank you. And to the question, Flynn, McCabe, Mitchell, Gronick, Royce, Vinehout, and Wax, all yes. Thank you. Okay, are we ready for the lightning round questions, Yolanda? Yes? Oh. Nice. Haven't seen that before. All right. <laughs> we have visuals. <laughs> All right. We have five lightning round questions. You'll answer in exactly the same way. And the first one deals with transit. I'm not going to do a long explanation of this, just a very brief one. The Wisconsin Transportation Finance and Policy Commission has said that they recommend $36.3 million increase for public transit per year. Do you support increasing annual public transportation investment by $36.3 million or more? You want me to do that? Sure. Okay. That is Green across the board. Flynn, McCabe, Mitchell, Gronick, Royce, Vinehout, and Wax. All yes, thank you. The second question involves education. Will you support the mandatory inclusion of information about dollars going to private schools in the property tax bills of every Wisconsin property owner? That's an interesting question. That's an, inter that's an interesting question. And that's Flynn, McCabe, Mitchell, Gronick, Royce, Vinehout, and Wax. All yes. Thank you. The third one deals with immigration. If you are elected governor, would you veto any legislation that would create a penalty for sanctuary cities in Wisconsin? Quick <laughs> answers. Flynn, McCabe, Mitchell, Gronick, Roy's Vinehout and Wax, all yes, thanks. Amen. The fourth question deals with pharmaceuticals. If elected governor, will you champion and sign legislation to hold bad actor pharmaceutical companies accountable for price gouging on off patient, off patent, and generic drugs? Thank you. Flynn, McCabe, Mitchell, Gronick, Roy's, Vinehout, and Wax. All yes, thanks. Okay, getting close. Last one. The last one deals with guns. If you are elected governor, would you support measures to require background checks for all gun sales, including at gun shows and between private parties? That's yes. Across the board, all yeses. Thank you. Thank you. So the candidates have heard a lot from us tonight. So now it's their opportunity to come up um, and speak on behalf. Uh, so the first person that I want to welcome up here is Kelda Royce. Thank you so much. I cannot tell you how incredibly touching it is to be filled with a room of people who are like-minded, who see injustice in the world and are not satisfied to let it continue, but are working and demanding accountability from leaders. Thank you for doing this. I have, 
just one criticism, and that is your expectations are too low. <laughs> the questions are too easy. Because when everyone can answer yes, it elides the real differences among the candidates that actually do exist. There is a difference in which candidates are really willing to take on the school privateers and bring the voucher program to an end and stop the charter programs that are taking public money away from our public schools. There is a real difference between candidates who talk about wanting to increase access to health care and those who have actually done it, as I did when I was the vice chair of the Committee on Health and Health Care Reform in the Assembly. We need a candidate like me who's been endorsed by Demand Universal Health Care because of my fight for single-payer health care for over 10 years. We need candidates who have a track record on immigration. Not only did I support in-state tuition for DREAMers and was on record in the legislature and I supported driver cards, but I also have called for the abolition of ICE. No child should be torn away from their parents regardless of what the parent may have done. We deserve a governor who is passionate about mass incarceration as I have been since I was a first year law student and learned that Wisconsin incarcerates a higher percentage of African American citizens than any other state in the nation. It is our shame and we need a governor who is committed to ending it. I am. And it starts with cash bail and it goes all the way to support for reentry and reforming our licensing program so that people who are incarcerated don't face a de facto life sentence when they get out. We need a governor who understands that water is life and who led the fight against the mining bill even when many other Democrats were afraid to talk about how mining wasn't just going to bring jobs, but it was going to destroy our environment and ultimately kill some of the most important industries in our state. I threatened to sue the Walker administration to get the records of his uh, contacts with mining executives because I knew there was something bad going on. And we need a governor with that political courage to do what is right, even when it's unpopular. We need a governor who is willing to stand up every single time to the special interests, whether it's price gouging pharmaceutical companies, whether it's private prisons, whether it's uh, people who want to take our transportation money, our public transit money, and give it away to big corporations. We need a governor who stands for opportunity and fairness for every single Wisconsin resident, regardless of the color of your skin, the zip code you grew up in, or how much money your parents earn. I will be that governor for you. My name is Calda Royce. And I could talk for hours about every single one of the issues that we talked about because I care deeply about making sure that the Wisconsin that my daughters and stepdaughters grow up in is one where all of your daughters and sons have the same opportunity to succeed, a real meaningful opportunity to succeed. And that's the kind of governor I'm going to be. But since I don't have hours, I want to tell you to please go to my website, keldaforgovernor.com, where I have outlined detailed plans that talk about exactly what I'm going to do when I'm your governor and after I earn your vote on August 14th and November 6th. We need someone who is ready to be governor on day one. This is a big, important job. And I have the experience necessary, not only as an attorney and a small business owner and as a mother, but as someone who served in the state legislature and has one of the most progressive voting records on issues like criminal justice reform, the environment, and public education. I know how to deal with the state budget and the administrative agencies. There's a lot of things that we asked here um, that we can do without even having a legislature. We can just direct the Department of Corrections and other administrative agencies to start doing the right thing. And as governor, I will do that. We need a governor with that experience to get the job done on day one. We need someone with the, the values to put all Wisconsin families first. And we need someone who can win. The stakes could not be higher. Whether it's talking about ending gun violence and keeping our community safe, we need somebody who is going to win this election. And we're not going to do it by rehashing what's happened in the past. We're not going to do it by talking about how bad the current governor is. We all understand that. We're going to do it by our vision for the future and how we're going to build a Wisconsin of opportunity and fairness together. Thank you so much. Thank you again, Calderoys. 
I would now like to welcome Matt Flynn. It's very good to be here with a lot of friends. And I remember my meeting up in Eau Claire with Expo and with Wisdom and uh, meeting in, in Mequon with the Wisdom people speaking. And it's great to see a room full of social justice. I want to address something right from the start that is on the minds of some people here and that you've heard about, which is my representation of the Archdiocese of Milwaukee. And I want to set the record straight for everybody in this room. I represent the Archdiocese, and that terrible priest abuse scandal came to light as I started to represent them. I come from a very large family. I went to parochial schools all my life. And when I first represented them, what I saw was an archdiocese that I knew and loved, and it was the nuns that I had taught me in school with the best teachers I ever had, including college, law school, and my Navy training. And it was also Catholic charities. It was also uh, kitchens and homeless shelters, and so many good things were done. It was not merely the bishops. And so when I got into it, it was obvious to me that there was a terrible problem in the church, a terrible stain on the church. And these victims could have been anybody that I gone to school with. And I can assure you that I had two missions, whatever you may have heard. One of them was to settle as fairly and compassionately as possible with those people. It took a great deal of courage to come forward. They were all represented by very good lawyers. They were treated respectfully. And if there was ever an, an episode where they weren't, those lawyers were perfectly capable of bringing complaints, and it never happened. But it's also important to understand that the major part of my charge is to make sure it never happened again. And that's what I did in that representation. We put into effect protocols and procedures so that priests that did offend were never transferred again. And since I left, it has never happened. A number of things have been said about my representation. I stopped representing the Archdiocese in 2004. Some of it had to do with the bankruptcy and the cemetery fund. That happened in 2011. So what you are seeing in some of these uh, circulars and so forth is plain false. And I, I will simply leave you with this, that the Republican Party, when I announced, said the Archdiocese was a dirty client, Quarles and Brady, my firm, was a dirty law firm, I'm a dirty lawyer, it's baloney. The Archdiocese is an excellent, excellent institution. I'm looking at some of it right here. That's what I represent. Now, the other thing I want to say is about immigration. A lot has been said about immigration. And I want you to know that when I was a kid, I spent the second and third grade in Mexico City. Y para la gente aquí que pueden hablar español, yo asistí a la escuela Fray Juan de Sumaraga. Vimos en la calle Nicolás San Juan. Yo recuerdo Insurgentes, el Paseo de la Reforma, la Ciudad de México, el Capital. Recuerdo Barel, Valeros, Capiruchos. Fuimos al parque Chapultepec cada, cada domingo para jugar y manejar bicicletas. I was the only American kid in that school. That was not a fancy American school. When I see a Mexican kid in Milwaukee right now, I think of Matt Flynn in the second grade. And you can hear all you want about people who have suddenly, they're woke on immigration, okay? I was woke on immigration in the second grade. You see what I'm saying? So you do not have to worry about any of these issues because this comes from the heart. The final thing I want to say is this. One of the most important issues in my campaign and why I propose the full legalization of marijuana for recreational purposes, for, for um, medicinal purposes, tax regulate for people over 21, is very simple. I'm going to get rid of mass incarceration. You understand? You understand? What I'm going to do is pardon everybody in our system, pardon them who are there for nonviolent possession offenses, and I'm going to go through all the records there and these cowboy judges that like to give 40-year sentences, and they go around, these Republican judges, and they say, well, I'm tough on crime. I'm going to make them put in an economic impact statement and say, this is going to be three million bucks, lifetime medical care, and those cheap taxpayers, and I'm one of the cheapest guys in this room, are not going to want to pay for 40 years of revenge, OK? Uh, you're going to find a different kind of, of uh, governor. My model was John F. Kennedy. It matters whether John F. Kennedy or Donald Trump is president. It matters whether Matt Flynn or Scott Walker is president. When I served in the Navy, I defended my country. When I served as a lawyer, I defended my clients. And when I serve as governor, I will defend you and the most unprotected and vulnerable people in society. Thank you very much.
All right, thank you, Matt Flynn. Next, I would like to welcome Dana Watts. Hi, folks. I'm, I'm Dana Watts. I represent Eau Claire in the state legislature. And I, uh, I often tell people I'm a trial lawyer, but I'm taking medication for that. But I, I, won't, I won't say that tonight. I, I've spent my life involved in public service to one extent or another. I, I was 10 years old. I had to lick stamps for Hubert Humphrey because my mom made me. I, uh, I worked for Ted Kennedy in 1980 when he ran for president. I was one of those kids that kept taking time off from, from college to work on one campaign or the other. And one of the lessons you learn in that situation is you learn to understand and care about other folks. Now, a few years ago, I've, I've been in the legislature three terms, in a, but I've been a trial lawyer for 32 years. I've been representing regular folks, regular folks against some of the most powerful, wealthy corporations in the United States. In fact, my first pleadings were a products liability case against, against a drug manufacturer for terrible injuries at my client. It was the first thing I did out of law school. So I stood in the well and I fought on behalf of regular folks all of my life. And a few years ago, I, got, I was asked to run for the legislature and I came to Madison and pretty quickly you realize and you understand that these same powerful corporate entities, these same billionaires are pushing our state around. They're running our policies and they don't give a damn about people. They do not. And that's going to change when I'm governor, I'm telling you that. That's an absolute fact. Some of these bills here today that you talked to, the, the RTA, Senator Vinehout and I uh, put, put that RTA, those RTA legislative uh, bills together. Uh, this bill talking about the disclosure of of the amount of taxes that are going to unaccountable voucher schools, which is a system that's going to come to an end when I'm governor. That's my bill. You know, if you believe in full disclosure and honesty, then you should tell everybody how much money is going to these unaccountable voucher schools. But I want to tell you why I'm here. Why am I here doing this? Why did I leave my law firm? My firm does a great deal. In fact, Mark Thompson's my partner down here in, Mad in Milwaukee. We do civil rights legislation or litigation. And I'm in this because I've seen in the system what injustice is. I remember Bruce and Diane, a Clark County family. Bruce and Diane worked like dogs for 35 years on their, on their farm. And then their youngest child turned 18 and the family lost their badger care. And a few weeks later, Diane was diagnosed with diabetes and a few months after that, she had to have a leg amputated. <laughs> so the family did what they thought was best. They did what they thought was just and correct and they sold their farm and Bruce went to work on the farm that he used to own. They sold their farm to pay the medical bills and Bruce went to work on that farm is an hourly employee on the farm that he used to own. And a few months after that, he was in a terrible car accident and he was rendered a paraplegic. These are people. We are in this because we love people. That's why we're in this. I'm one of two Democrats on that Weedick board. I've been fighting that Foxconn thing since they rolled it out. And I'll tell you what, if I'm governor, we're going to hold that company accountable and hopefully get rid of them because that's not an, inv that's not an investment in people. We are going to be investing in regular folks. That's why I'm in this. And by God, we're going to do it and we're gonna all work together and we're gonna have a Wisconsin that cares about people again. That is my charge. That is what I'm gonna do 
when I'm governor of the state of Wisconsin. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dana Watts. I would like to now welcome Mike, Mc Mike McCabe. Thank you everybody for being here. For those of you who came up and shared your stories, thank you for having the courage to share those stories. Thank you for asking the questions that you're asking. They're critically important questions to ask. But I have to say that if we're going to get to a better place on the issues that you're raising, we've also got to have the courage to have conversations all over the state of Wisconsin about things that people won't talk about, that they're uncomfortable discussing. We've got to deal with the fact that we live in a country that started with a constitution that said people could be property. And once that constitution was amended, and once slavery was abolished, those who sought that kind of economic and social control weren't about to embrace equality. They went about constructing Jim Crow. Yeah. They went about building segregation laws that would allow them to continue to exercise that control. And once Jim Crow was swept away by the civil rights legislation of the 1960s, they didn't embrace equality. They went about building a new structure. And that structure stands on some pretty sturdy legs. It stands on voter suppression policies that have been created. It stands on mass incarceration. It stands on an evolution of policing philosophy. Every squad car in America used to say protect and serve. And now the philosophy of policing has become intimidate and control. That is the new Jim Crow. That is the new Jim Crow. And if we're going to get to a better place, about all the things you care about, all the issues you raise, all the questions you ask, if we're going to get answers, we have to commit ourselves to cutting the legs out from underneath that new Jim Crow. I want to live in a Wisconsin that aims to erase the words working poor from our vocabulary. I want that phrase to go away, and that means a living wage for every worker, and health care for all, and high... And affordable, debt-free education for all of our young people. It means, it means committing our state to dealing with the disgrace of having a state budget that spends more on prisons than the entire university system. It means, it means doing away with crimeless parole revocation. It means fully legalizing marijuana. We've got to stop locking up nonviolent offenders. It, it, means, it means dealing with that rhetoric that's been shoved down our throats that we got to be tough on crime, Wisconsin has been dumb on crime. Because right across the border to the west, right across the border to the west, you got a state that imprisons half as many people, and yet our two states have virtually identical crime rates. So imprisoning twice as many people has not reduced crime in Wisconsin. It's just less left us with the stain of a state budget that spends more locking people up than we spend on unlocking human potential. But if we're going to get to that Wisconsin, if we're going to achieve that Wisconsin, we've got to do something else. We've got to deal with the fact that there's a cancer growing in the body of our democracy. I have spent my life, my adult life, seeking to expose and break the grip of big money influence in politics. And one of the things I can tell you about all that money power is that less than one half of one percent of the American population supplies two thirds of all the political money. And what I can also tell you about that tiny segment of society that spends all this money to influence our politics is that what they want our government to do is vastly different from what you want our government to do. And they get their way on every issue we care about. We've allowed cronyism and corruption and what amounts to legal bribery to take root in our state, and it has to be uprooted because we will not get good health care from a sick political system. We will not get living wages from a dying democracy. We will never get anything more than thoughts and prayers 
after each new mass shooting from elected officials as long as they're paid to take no other action. We have got to deal with that cancer growing in the body of our democracy, and we've got to cut out that cancer. Thank you. Thank you, Mike McCabe. I would now like to welcome Malin Mitchell. It's hard to follow Mike, I ain't gonna lie to you. <laughs> so everything he just said, I agree with, so thank you. <laughs> Mike, you had me clapping for you for a minute there. I was like, wait a minute, I'm running against that. Anyway. Uh, thank you all for having me. Um, you know, I, I want to first of all thank everyone for their uh, uh, questions and all the folks that came up here and uh, told us your stories because uh, it's hard to do that in, in front of a group of people that you don't know necessarily. Um, but we, I think in this room we're all family. But I, I appreciate the stories and I will tell you that um, I've been a firefighter for over 20 years. And the reason I was a little bit late because I'm actually convening over our biennial state convention in the city of Madison right now, where we have about 250 delegates um, that convene upon Madison from all across this state. And uh, if you look at my room, it's not as diverse as this. Uh, I represent a majority white male union. Um, 250 delegates, if you would came to my convention, which is having right now, you'd see 249 of those are white males. <laughs> and I'm their president, and they just elected me again today, actually, for four more years. <laughs> so I, I say that not to pat myself on the back, but I say it to let you know that in order to win this state, in order to actually win Wisconsin, we need to bring back voters that we have lost, so to speak, in time. And it's a lot of my members that have voted for Obama and then four years have voted for Donald Trump. I also know that we need to bring black voters. And I'm the candidate that can do that. That's why I opened an office on Northside Milwaukee on MLK and Vine. So we can bring out. And we have a plan to bring out 50,000 more African American voters, more minorities, more young people. And we can do this and we can win. But let's talk about the issues that we talked about today. Because a budget is a moral document. A budget shows your values. And in 2017, we spent $1.2 billion on incarcerating people, more than in the UW system. My daughter's a freshman at UW Oshkosh. We spent $1.2 billion on incarcerating people. That's not our values. That's not the values of the state of Wisconsin. So I'll talk about some of the things we talked about today. We need to end truth and sentencing. We were warned back in 2006 that that would cost us $1.8 billion. Truth and sentencing has had the reverse effect of what it was intended to do. We can put 16,000 people in jail in the state of Wisconsin. Right now, we have over 24,000 people incarcerated, a lot of them for minor offenses. So what can we do in our state? Right now, we can end the money bill. We've got to stop prosecuting marijuana, small offenses. I've come out for full legalization of recreational medicinal marijuana. We got to ban the box. Because we know, because we know if there's an F on the front of that application, where the application is probably going. In the garbage. It's being recycled. So a person doesn't even get a chance to actually give their what happened or how they actually turned around. So we can do that here in our state. We have an opportunity to end mass incarceration. We are the worst place in the country to be African American, to be black. We shouldn't clap for that, that's horrible. And if you haven't noticed, I'm black. But incarceration doesn't happen in a vacuum. We have to end the school to prison pipeline. And we can only do that by strengthening our communities. Because a lot of people talk about opportunity gap, or they talk about achievement gap. But we will not actually end those gaps until we actually make our communities better for everybody. 
especially black people, minorities across the state. We will never end the opportunity gap if we do not make our, our communities better for everybody. So I'm here. I'm here to run. You can't clap. I only got one minute left. It is not lost, I got 30 seconds. <laughs> it is not lost on me that I am raising black kids in the worst state in the country to be black. But I'm running to change that. And I want your support. I want your help. I'm asking for you to believe in me, but more importantly, I'm asking for you to believe in yourselves, in the capacity for change, and that we can create opportunities for this entire state. Because we have the fierce urgency of now to put people over politics. We have the fierce urgency of now to put people over bad policy. We even have the fierce urgency of now to put people over bad policy and bad parties. But we can do this together if we work together. We have a mantra in the state called all hands working, and I'm going to stop by, I promise you, but we can make history. <laughs> we can make history in this state. I'd be the first African-American governor, but you know what? <laughs> I can't do anything in five minutes. We can make history, but you know we got to make it count. So thank you all for coming, and I'll talk to you later. Thank you, <laughs> Mayla Mitchell. I would like to now welcome Andy Gronick. Hi, everybody. Great speeches tonight, everybody. So uh, I'm here because I'm with you. So each one of you have lived a life where you know it's not this simple. It's not green, red, and yellow, right? We can all put these up, but we know these problems are incredibly, incredibly difficult, and they've been happening in our state to you personally or to your families for a long time. So I'm not here to tell any one of you that when I'm your governor, it's going to be this simple. When you look at my website, which is andygronick.com, you're going to find very detailed, very pragmatic plans that look at the system as a system that's broken, in a political system that's broken, and actually identifies optimistic plans to actually take care of and to begin to address the very incredibly difficult issues that we talked about today. But everyone who shared here today had one thing in common, and that is every person can be treated and should be treated as a human being. Is that not what you all were saying? Yes. Okay, so from a system perspective, that's what I did for 35 years. For 35 years, I parachuted into very difficult circumstances, working with troubled companies that couldn't go out and get a conventional bank loan, to solve those problems so they could access capital and move forward and create more jobs for the people who work there. Every single one of them was tough. I built one of the largest businesses of its type doing that. But you've heard a lot of political speeches today. And they're rousing. They're rousing political speeches. But this gentleman, he hit the nail on the head. What are you actually going to do when you get there? Well, last week, I had the state GOP, on behalf of Governor Walker, challenge 1,770 signatures, nomination signatures from my campaign that came from my hometown of Milwaukee, where lots of black and brown people live. And they took issue with the fact that my campaign engaged people with previous felony records to go out and collect some signatures for me. So I want to tell you folks, everybody in this room, if you have any question who Andy Gronick is and why I'm here and whether or not I'm with you, you should look at what I'm actually doing. Because what I'm actually doing 
is I'm running a campaign that recognizes that if you've made a mistake and you've been incarcerated in your life, that not every sentence should be a life sentence. And I'll skip you to the end, and I'll tell you that not one signature was lost by the election commission, but I'll also tell you this. Rather than do what I've been told so many campaigns would do, which is to disavow knowledge of actually having someone with a previous felony conviction working for me, I had a press conference the next day. And those brave people showed up to that press conference. And we talked about the fact that these individuals are moving on with their lives and what it's like to have a previous felony conviction and have to live that life sentence for their entire life. We got up in front of the cameras and not only do we not disavow this, we embrace the fact that this is how we run a Wisconsin going forward. That we're here on behalf of all of the people who live here. That we're here to give everybody in the state of Wisconsin a voice because that's what this is supposed to be all about. Right? Right. right. Okay, so if you want to know who I'm going to be as your governor, just look at what I did last week. Because I'm here not to talk about things. I'm here to do things. I'm here as a problem solver who brings people together, who gets things done, who cares deeply about people and every one of the issues that you have in this room. And if you want to know what I'm going to do, just look at my website, because there's not one website in this entire campaign that's more definitive on issues and plans and how we're going to get it done. So if you want to win, because we've lost three times to Governor Walker with politicians that are from the establishment, if you truly want to win and have a shot at getting this thing done, then stop doing the same thing over and over and over again, expecting different results. If you want to win, vote for Andy Gronick on August 14th. I'm easy to find on the ballot because I'm number one, and that's a sign of things to come. Yes. All right, thank you, Andy Gronick. I would now like to welcome Kathleen Vino. Thank you. Tonight, I want to take you on two journeys. Two journeys that represent two very different visions for our state, two very different priorities. The first is the path that we're on now, the, that we're traveling under the direction of Mr. Walker. I call it Fox Conway, and it's $3 billion long. How long is $3 billion? Um, long, imagine with me a path of $100 bills laid end to end. There's $100 every six inches, $6,000 every 10 steps, $1,056,000 every mile. So we begin this path end to end in Racine, where that company, Foxconn, is. Go west to Madison, to the Twin Cities, across Minnesota, the Dakotas, Montana, <laughs> over the Rockies, $600 every step along Fox Conway, cross into Washington, to Seattle, then south past to Portland, the Redwoods, San Francisco, <laughs> and we still have 17 miles to go of $100 bills end to end to reach the end of Fox Conway. The second path is the path that Rachel walks. Rachel is a single mom, works 40 hours a week, 52 weeks a year, at a minimum wage job in Racine. On a path of $100 bills laid end to end, how far does Rachel travel, starting at her front door? on a minimum wage job, in two weeks, she takes one step. In a year, she gets from her front door to the sidewalk. 
after a lifetime of working from the age of 16 to the age of 70, she will be less than a mile down the street that she lives on. These priorities are upside down. I'm running for governor to put Rachel first. First when it comes to spending state dollars. First when it comes to the center of state policy. Foxconn and those other companies don't need handouts. But Rachel, she needs a hand up. We can't spend the same dollar twice. Budgets are about choices. They reflect our values and our priorities, such as fairness and opportunity. Rachel is my priority. Health care for her children, including her son who suffers from mental illness. Reproductive health care so she can get her birth control pills. Great schools for her children. Free tuition for her to learn new skills. Safe streets, parks, clean water. Public transit to get her home. Alternatives for incar to incarceration for her son. Now let's take the Medicaid expansion money, cover 79,000 more people, and the money saved invested in community-based mental health and addiction recovery yeah. services. Yeah. So we provide treatment instead of incarceration, like to those folks like Rachel's son. In the alternative budgets I have written over the last eight years, I have paid for all of these programs using the same dollars, but different priorities to put the Rachels of the state first. Because when we invest in our people, in our human potential, then our communities thrive. Let's put people first. Election day, we can choose. Traveling Foxconn way with those dollars from, San, from Racine to San Francisco or a different path. A path that lifts up the Rachels all across our state. This is what I did with my alternative budget as senator. This is my vision for the state and this is my commitment as governor. I ask for your vote to help me and all of us put people first. Thank you very much. First of all, we have some housekeeping to do. David gave me a script, because he know me by now. <laughs> Along with your program, you were given an envelope. I'd like to ask you all to fill it out and turn it in to the people at the door with the basket when you leave. I want to especially call your attention to three things. On the envelope, you have the option to check if you want to be added to the Wisdom Action Network list. In your program book, there is a description of what it is. It is a companion organization to Wisdom, but it is a 501c4 group. That means it can comment on political things and candidates and the like. If you get on that list, you will get, for example, the results of the straw poll from tonight, which you have also been given that you can turn in at the door. The envelope is for a reason. It is to make it easy for you to make a donation. <laughs> Please note that you can choose whether you want to, your donation to go to Wisdom or you want it to go to the Wisdom Action Network your generosity will greatly be appreciated. When we finish, there is no rush to leave. There is more information available from the candidates. There is more information from some of our co-sponsors and from some of our wisdom campaigns. Stay for a bit to learn more 
and meet some of the people, if you'd like. Now, that being said, <laughs> all of you, all of you are my brothers and sisters. Some of you are light-skinned. But we have learned, as black people, how to deal with our light-skinned brothers and sisters. <laughs> we sometimes treat them as stepchildren. <laughs> but what you have heard tonight, if you lack the ability to have health care, if you lack the ability to get a free education, if you lack the ability to get fair treatment in the criminal justice system, if you lack the ability to get treatment from drugs and alcohol and other addiction, you are already in prison. If you lack the ability to travel, to have transit, to get around your city, to get around your community, and you can't, you are already in prison. They just pluck you off one by one and put you in jail that way. But we have a history. Remember back when the crack epidemic and the uh, cocaine epidemic was sweeping the cities? And I kept watching people on the news saying, that don't happen in our community. We're not used to that thing happening in our community. Well, guess what? Opioids are here. And your community is impacted the same way my community is, and we are all together in this thing together. You have got to do better than we did last time. Remember, I am you, my sisters and brothers, so I'm going to talk rough to you like your family members. <laughs> Last time, we failed because every time we have an election, we go out to the polls, we shake our hands, we go to drink, go sit down in our living room and watch TV and forget about it. Well, you can't do that anymore. You can't not afford to sit down on your laurels anymore. I'm tired of them talking about immigration. There is no immigration on the planet Earth. We were all meant to go where the hell we wanted to go. The God I serve, the God I serve wanted the laws to reflect the laws in heaven, which meant that everybody was treated like everybody else. And there was no race, color, or creed added to that. So when you start demonizing other people, guess what? They're demonizing you too. Because if they're going to demonize them today, guess what? They're coming for you next. We have got to stand together and realize that we do not stand apart from anybody on this planet. We do not stand apart from any people on anywhere. When they go and build a mine, take a mine and take away water from a plantation, they're taking away water from us. They're taking away water from human beings. We are all spiritually connected. Do not get it twisted. You are not better than anybody else in this room. You are no different from anybody else in this room. We keep telling them so now young people are not standing up. Young people don't, don't mean for anything. What do you think the NFL players are doing right now? <laughs> and I love the flag, but the flag do not come before people. The flag does not represent me when it comes to my brothers and sisters being shot down in the street. You can take that flag and put it you know where. People are more than that flag. So don't let them to deceive you. Tell them Reverend Briscoe. We are, we are all in this together, whether you want to believe it or not. Because if you don't look out for Milwaukee, Walker Show is next. If you don't look out for Walker Show, it's coming to Madison. We have got to stop being separate on this thing because we've been put it against one another. We are being told that this, these people are worse than those others. And if you don't stand up, corporations will stand on you. They will stand on you. I am dealing with the health care facilities now. And it shouldn't be health care, it should be health maintenance. 
That's why we are dying because we wait for health care. You're supposed to go before you get sick. You're supposed to be treated before you are ill. You're supposed to be treated before you have some illness. We have the ability right now to make America great once and for all. Because it's been a mess in the past. It has never been great. It has been ruled by people who did not have our interest in mind. Did not have our best hopes in mind. I remember in Milwaukee coming up in high school, you were limited to about 10 blocks that you could live on, that you could move around in. That's not living, that's prison, that's a plantation. We need to get out of this plantation mentality and get into a worldwide mentality, which means all people are our brothers and sisters. There are no immigrants, there are no foreigners, there are only us who speak a different language and look a little different than we do. If you don't take a chance right now and take control and get involved and get busy, this country is going down the sewer really fast. Martin Luther King said we were on the, the same path as the Roman Empire. We know do what happened to that. It's not exist anymore. It thought that it had could own the whole world, tough talking tough, could annex the whole world. And right now, we have President Trump, Kim Jong-un, and Dennis Rodman. <laughs> That's who is deciding your future of education. That's who is deciding your future of criminal, criminal justice. That's who is deciding your future of transportation. Take back what's yours. Take back what's yours. It's because the government was designed to be for the people and by the people, not despite the people. Yes. <laughs> we have got to seize power now and never let it go again. Because if you want to think this is the baddest it can get, it can get worse than this, and it probably will after tonight. <laughs> Stand up. Stand beside somebody, join something, read those packets you got. I got some people here that we put 30 seconds. <laughs> but I'm gonna tell you, you can commit to this for life because my brothers and sisters in Micah have, my brothers and sisters in the Wisdom Network have, and my national brothers and sisters in the Gamaliel Foundation have. <laughs> Commit to something for life because there are going to be the enemies out there for life that don't mean you no good. So you have got to join something, be about something, and stand with your brothers and sisters. You're all my brothers and sisters. All of you. Whether you like it or not, so loan me some money and put it in those envelopes. <laughs> God bless you. Bless you, candidate, for coming out and being courage, courageous in what you're doing and standing up for Wisconsin. Uh -huh. We want to make a new Wisconsin. All of our sponsors, thank you from the bottom of our heart. And all of you, my brothers and sisters in Christ and in whatever faith you are in, we are going to do this thing, and we are going to do it right, Woo! and we're going to never let it go again. Thank you. Yeah.